What is up, YouTube? So, a couple of months ago, I sat down and binge-watched Star Trek Discovery, and then recorded myself reacting to every single episode. And I promised you guys a full, comprehensive review on that show. So, you yeah, got my reactions. You have not, until now, gotten my review of the show. Mostly because the algorithm gods that we know as YouTube kept on flagging my show and taking it down. But uh, I am actually kind of glad about that because the more I thought about it, the more I realized that this show was much more than the sum of its parts. And I'm especially glad that it kept on getting taken down because it has allowed me to do this right now, which will be, in a way, my review of Star Trek Discovery, but also act as a backdoor pilot to a new series here on the Nerdy Nomicon channel called Sinful Analysis. Yes, I know it's spelled differently than sinful. It's spelled as cinephile, but that in itself may or may not be a double meaning, which may or may not be kind of the central focus of this show. Don't at me. So I know that a bunch of you guys, or at least one guy who from here forth is going to be referred to as Steve, wanted that review. And to that, I will say, Steve, dial it back a little bit, buddy, because here it is, guys. Okay. Um, Music's showing up here, so I'm running out of time for this opening. So uh, here it is, folks, the pilot episode of Sinful Analysis, where I'm going to be discussing Star Trek Discovery. Oh, come on, man. I so please don't knock over my heart. Star Trek Discovery is a 2017 reboot slash prequel to the beloved original series, which itself is currently in a state of reboot, which kind of happened after a reboot, which stemmed from a reboot, which was in itself kind of a... Okay, so there's a lot of Star Trek. And to be fair, calling most of these reboots is more than a little bit disingenuous, as the vast majority of these iterations are merely continuations of the original series. Following new ships, new generations... Oh, I'm sorry, that's next generations. And especially new captains. The only true actual reboot is the new film series from the Faraday Cage brain of this guy, which admittedly I kinda like. Come at me, bro. Ready for some knowledge bombs? Cause here comes some knowledge bombs. Star Trek is more than just a pop culture phenomenon. The story of its inception and the legacies of the cast and crew on many iterations will continue to echo throughout history, and that is not hyperbole. November 22nd, 1968 marked the first interracial kiss on television. The kissers being my man Billy Bob Shatner and Nichelle Nichols, who rocked so damn hard I gave myself a concussion just saying her name. Nichelle not only was an amazing actress, but was also the first black female in fake outer space. That's a weird statement, right? Well, get ready, because here's where it's about to come full circle. After the cancellation of Trek, she began working and recruiting for NASA. Nichelle found the first female astronaut, the first black astronaut, and the first female black astronaut. From fake space to real space. This woman isn't just a cultural icon, she's a civil rights and feministic icon. That ain't nothing. I want to start out talking about legacy for a little bit. Star Trek as a fandom, let alone as a pop culture pillar, is nearly incomprehensible. Most things that would be unforgivable for any other series on television is just kind of like standard operating procedure in the Trekiverse. No, like the fact that the first two seasons of nearly every iteration is widely regarded to suck, And fans are all like, yeah, but after season three, it really gets going. I can think of no other program or piece of fandom where opinions like that are commonplace, and yet this IP is still so fervently protected. And that's the interesting part about what's been happening over the last decade. I mean, the last time we saw Star Trek on television was way back in 2005 when Enterprise concluded. 
We got ourselves a reboot and a half with this new film series which featured characters from the original series conveniently taking place in an alternate timeline known as the Kelvin timeline. And the only reason that I'm bringing them up is because of the polarization and the hatred of the new iteration and vision of Star Trek. These films have been almost as polarizing as certain installments of another film series that I know. <laughs> yeah, and I have a lot to say about that too. There will be an episode about that in the future. Probably not this year. I did way too much to write about. So in the wake of all this polarization, we get the newest televised version in over a decade, and it's supposed to be set before TOS in the Prime timeline and deal with the Klingon War. Apparently, that's what we were supposed to get, and instead we got oh, this. Hail the most imperial Majesty, Mother of the Fatherland, Overlord of Vulcan, Dominus of Kronos. Needless to say, the backlash has been quite significant. Mutiny, murder, a discombobulated storyline, people not digging the flagship actress. I'm calling her that for a reason, and I'll get back to that. The criticisms seem almost endless here. Despite the fact that most fans that I've talked to and surrounded myself with all agree that in most cases the first couple of seasons of all Star Trek are bad, so why? Why the hate like this? I mean, I had my feelings and opinions after binging it myself, but before I start diving in real deep with Discovery and start picking it apart, let's do a round of things that are awesome about this show in 60 seconds or less! Burnham rules, Loka rules, Tilly rules, Hot Evil Tilly definitely rules, Michelle Yeoh, always a treasure, Evil Emperor, Sam from Trick or Treat, you know, under the mask, Creepy Ass Monster, this shit right here, Tony Rapp, Star Trek's version of the Iron Throne, I mean, you can't tell me you don't see it there, Cool Ass Space Battles, Cutie with the Headgear, Volk Ash or Ash Volk. What do I call you now? I don't... Hey, is it still just Ash? What the hell? We're talking about Star Trek, not Ex Machina. Oh yeah, she was on the bridge. Alright, big win for you, honey. You look awesome. Harry Mud! Fox Daddy knows Kung Fu! Like it or hate it, you cannot deny that this show had huge buckets of win. But all of that stuff is on the surface level, isn't it? How did this show come together? How did all of these elements coalesce to make one giant delicious cacophony of sci-fi awesome? Well, at first glance, while I was approaching all of the episodes, I admittedly liked them as singular episodes, but I was kind of disappointed and at times downright frustrated with the narrative structure. I need to talk about expectations here for a minute. This season was marketed to be about the Klingon War. A war so popular and so often talked about that even I, the casualist of casual watchers of Star Trek, knew about it. I mean, I knew about this Klingon War and I had absolutely no idea what the hell a Dominion War even was. That's what I mean when I say casual. So in the grand scheme of things, I felt how little time was actually spent on the war overall was disappointing. I'm pretty sure they spent more time in the Mirror Universe than they did actually fighting Klingons, and with tech like the Discovery, every single episode should have been all about making it funky on some bad guys. But no, not so much. And then to have all of this, this whole season of tension and build up, end so abruptly and in such an awkward way, basically through extortion. I mean, it's like Tony Soprano is at the helm being all like, don't attack Earth, you prick, or I'll fuck up your world. You, you prick. Dude. Weak. Motherfucker! So, yeah, like most everyone I talked to and listened to, I was off put. Everyone seemed to be all over Sidney Martin Green and hating her character, Burnham. Criticizing her acting on the show, despising the blossoming love story with Ash Tyler. Look, I understand. Star Trek has always, yes, been an ensemble show. Everybody can point to their Data and their Spock and their Seven of Nines, but ultimately, this has always been a captain's show. TOS had Shatner, and TG belonged to Jean-Luc Picard, okay? He owns it. Hell, even Enterprise is all about the bacula, so it would make sense, sure, that we're all going to fall in love with the crew of STD. Yeah, that's the abbreviation of this show, guys. TOS, STD, 
yeah, that happened to us, and we just didn't realize it at the time. But the show would belong to the captain, just like it always had in the past. At first, we thought it was going to be Captain Giorgio, but we quickly learned that our new captain is Lorca, and I don't think I heard anyone complain about that, frankly. But that didn't happen. Expectations be damned, that wasn't our character surrogate. Our lead was Michael Burnham. And I think that was the point. Star Trek Discovery, at least for season one, is not a Star Trek story. It's the story of Michael Burnham. Star Trek has always, at its heart, been about the better angels of our nature. Non-violence, de-escalation, a bunch of Boy Scouts legitimately going all Magellan on the universe, seeking new life and new civilizations. But Discovery was the first of the series to boldly go where no Trek had gone before. This story wasn't about the many, it was about the one. Or to be more precise, it was the story about the one coming to grips with her better angels for the good of the many. That's the rub. Star Trek isn't what it once was. Times change, people change, the future that we once envisioned has indeed changed. And this show wears that like a badge of honor on its sleeve. It shows through every facet of production. Of course the ships are going to look different now, they have to. The future we envision in the 60s, 80s, hell, even 90s is quickly becoming outdated with what we have available to us today. Of course the narrative had to change. We aren't in an age of pushback against the Vietnam War anymore. We aren't in a post-Cold War 80s. We aren't in the boom of the 90s. This is a different era, an era dominated by the self. A story about a crew of boy and girl scouts, and one brownie, Helping civilizations is a beautiful thing to have on television, and frankly, I believe it's something that we all really need right now. But I think the more important story to tell first is how to get to that place. Well, looking at the season as a whole through the lens of this being Burnham's story, the narrative finally started to coalesce for me. It coalesced because I could see this as a tale of a rising star in Starfleet fall to such extreme depths based on ultimately her own notions of morality. It didn't feel like a disjointed mess anymore, with one foot in the Klingon War and one in the Mirror Universe, which would make Harry Mudd be hanging out somewhere relatively inappropriate, but to be honest, that kind of works for him, so I guess, yeah. Burnham was born to human parents who were killed when she was a kid during a Klingon raid. She was then adopted by Sarek, a Vulcan, and his human wife, Amanda, and then moved to the Vulcan homeworld to live with them and her new adopted brother, Spock. She was the first human to attend both the Vulcan Learning Center and the Vulcan Science Academy. After her graduation, Burnham applied to join the Vulcan Expeditionary Group, but wouldn't you know it, they rejected her application on the basis of Burnham being human and forced Sarek to choose between allowing Michael to join now or allowing Spock to join in the future, which, reluctantly, Sarek chose Spock, and they said that they rejected her because of her insufficient abilities. That is the perfect soup to make anyone conflicted. That is an anti-hero backstory. Burnham has a more tragic backstory than half of the DC or Marvel Universe. She joined Starfleet, but her confidence in herself was forever destroyed. Do you have any idea what that did to me? I did not. But I do now. The series picks up over seven years later after this, and she still believes that Sarek, her foster father, and the only male role model she had to look up to was ashamed of her and that Sarek was wrong to believe in her, never once realizing that Sarek was overcome with his own personal shame over having to make a real Sophie's choice, his real son or his adoptive daughter, two candidates that flat out deserved their spot. A choice that would ultimately be rendered meaningless as Spock joined Starfleet anyway, so he crushed his daughter's dreams and broke her heart for nothing. Abandonment issues, an inferiority complex, survivor's guilt, unquestionably PTSD, and also, you know, a mentor in the Starfleet that's obviously all about breaking the rules for the greater good. good. I mean, come on! They break the Prime Directive in the first five minutes of the pilot episode. It's no wonder why she would stage a mutiny in the face of a Klingon threat, especially considering the advice she got from Sarek. Advice that 
ultimately added up to her. Find the biggest bully and knock him out? She's faced with a culture that neither she nor anyone else understands. A culture that is based on war, conflict, and violence. And your reactions to it are what either grants you respect or deems you unworthy of it. So, of course she would do the one thing, the only thing she could think of to stop a crisis from arising, but ultimately, it was in vain. I realize I'm giving what sounds like a character bio on Michael Burnham, but I assure you that isn't the case. Her history leading directly to this conflict which set off the Klingon War is the driving force of the show. A history that we're fed in little bits throughout the season's run. At the beginning of episode 3, what most people tend to think of as the actual first episode of this show, as it's the first time we see the Discovery, she's a shell of a human being. Every single person she has ever known or loved has either died because of her or been betrayed by by her. This is the state that she's in. This is our protagonist. A broken, desolate shell of a human who, because of her upbringing due to circumstances beyond her control, can barely even identify as such. Everyone else is just scenery to her. Notice so few of the crew are fleshed out or even have more than a handful of lines during the entire season. How many other crew members' names do you even know? And I think that was actually by design. I mean, we're seeing this entire show through her perception, through her lens. All of her fears, all of her emotional baggage we have to deal with and feel as well. That is our through line to the entire show. She sees the crew as background characters, and by extension, so do we. That's why we don't have very many of the crew actually fleshed out. That's why we see more characterization with certain characters fleshed out in the mirror universe than we do in the prime universe. She interacts with them more. She's talking with them more. We don't know, nor do we necessarily at most points in the series care who this person is, because Michael doesn't. She's peripheral to her. She doesn't matter. This is wartime now, and it's only through the growth of Burnham, through the crucible of a life she has been given, that desolation and genocide can be avoided. It took seeing the torture of an innocent life form for the purpose of creating a faster method of travel for the compassion for life to be reinvigorated in the crew. It took traveling to a mirror universe and facing the doppelgangers of people she loved and respected to see that anger and hate and rage will ultimately spell doom for the universe. And how about the fact that she ended up with a love interest on this show? Ash Tyler, who already made it on the list of awesome things, so we're glossing right over that Greek statue of a face to get to who he represents to her. Finally, she can let her guard down. Here is someone who understands closer than anyone else what she has been through. Someone who has been tortured by the Klingons, lost crewmates, lost pieces of himself, pieces of humanity that can never grow back. But, oh wait... Homeboy is a Klingon in disguise. He's a skin suit in more ways than one for Voke. Oh! Oh, and Voke is also the Klingon word for trust, so deep fans had a hint slash Easter egg the whole time. Don't at me, I just did my research. So now Burnham, and by extension us, is faced with an existential crisis. What does the enemy look like? What do villains look like? And when faced with a proposition at the end of the season for an even more painful question, what do monsters look like? Are the Klingons as a whole the monster because their warrior culture and the fact that a handful of them murdered her family and ultimately set her on this path, does that make them the villains? Or maybe... Humans in the Federation are the monsters because of their plans to commit genocide to end the war. Fire. Perhaps the fact that nearly every other Mirror Universe character is a darker reflection of themselves, and yet, Burnham's still chose to betray their murderous cause to choose life. If that's the case for the Burnham Danger, then which version is she? She can choose. Enter the Better Angels. When standing up for principles is all that we have. It's what makes us human. Or Vulcan or Andorian. Seriously, guys. Come on, I'm trying to make a point here. But the question needs to be asked. What do villains look like? That's the central question of the whole damn season. And to drive this point home, we had to take the ride on this wild ride of Discovery with Michael Burnham. I'm not saying that this has become my new jam. I'm still not a Trekkie, but 
On this show, I want to talk about things that I enjoy that are clever in some way to drive home a point. This show is way more than the sum of its parts. I mean, look at the Klingons. They're no longer the homogenous, stereotypical, self-parodying Klingons that we all knew. These new Klingons have a lot more to them. Goals, fears, motivations that we can all understand. Maybe not agree with, but understand nonetheless. Under a fear of the loss of their culture due to expansionism, they fight back to preserve what makes them, them. Even their look to me is beautifully nuanced in a narrative sort of way. Look, Klingons have been in our pop culture for nearly half a century now. Half a damn century. And sure, there have been minor alterations to their aesthetic, but I mean these Klingons. Something totally new to everyone. Something hostile, something foreign, something that we don't like, something that just makes us tense. And I'm not talking about the show right now. I'm talking about us. I'm talking about the fans. Stew on this one for a second. Perhaps one of the more clever things that this show did wasn't the subversive narrative about how to rise to become a better angel. Maybe the most clever thing that they did was to actually start a Klingon war amongst the show watchers. These new Klingons are in fact foreign, or if I may, alien to us. More people can identify a Klingon than many other ethnic types or even languages currently on Earth. To me personally, I think it was brilliant to alienate in the purest possible terms of that word the audience from what a Klingon looks like. Doesn't it make sense that a reboot of a show that is about acceptance, exploration, learning about new cultures and civilizations might try to make us feel like we actually are seeking out new life and cultures? Then posing that question to us to accept this new alien life form as it is for the greater good? But I don't know, that's just me. And maybe the planet just had mass alopecia. Got him. Hey, it's me again. The guy you just listened to for the last, like, half hour. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed the first episode of Sinful Analysis. Hope maybe this helped you look at Star Trek in a completely new and hopefully fun way. So, um... If you liked this video, make sure that you hit the like button down there. Please don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment. I love reading the comments and every single one of those three things that I just listed, I like to call them as the Holy Trilogy, um, they help this channel grow, help more people see us, help me show up on more lists, and help me not fade into general obscurity due to the algorithms of the old ones. So. I would really appreciate it. Also, feel free to follow us on social media. You can always talk to me there, talk to any of the other people that work at the Artful Gremlins there, Adrian, Holly, uh, you can get at the Synthaholics Brood there. Um, what else do I want to tell you guys? I think I want to tell you guys some more. Um, this is going to be a bi-weekly show, and I'm not usually going to be talking about TV shows, it's mostly going to be movies, but there are some shows that I have something or another to say about them. But uh, the next, like, probably 20, maybe, are all going to be movies. And the next one's going to be kind of interesting. Uh, it's something that I did as a challenge, and it turned out interesting and different. So I can't wait for you guys to see that one. It's already in the can, and it's going to be premiering in two weeks. Um, these are probably going to be on every Tuesday. So I think I've said enough. I'm going to go out of here. Um, once again, like, subscribe, and comment, please. Bye!